My goal is to someday share all of this with you, but the reality is that I'll only be able to share a small pocket somewhere down here on the lower right. I want to start my discussion with all of you with a simple concept. We stand here in the middle of the desert to share our ideas, our tribulations, our triumphs, in hopes that we can further enhance our clinical skill set. I know I've accomplished that, and I think that the Dental XP program and everyone behind it deserves a standing ovation for allowing us the opportunity to be here. And the reality is, is that I hope, too, to have a butterfly effect with all of you. So years ago, there was this gentleman named Edward Lorenz. Edward Lorenz was a meteorologist. And at that time, he had postulated this theory that if a butterfly were to flap its wings in Las Vegas, for example, the turbulence in the air that it created would later create a tornado in Miami, Florida. And at the time that he postulated this theory, everyone laughed at him. But today, this theory has been proven to be correct by two physicists. Today, we call it the chaos theory. And the chaos theory is this. For every action that you and I take, there's actually a deterministic and linear effect at a later point in time. So what that means is on Monday morning, when you decide to treat a patient with any given clinical therapy, you have a lasting effect on that patient. And you send a ripple effect, a ripple of crap effect across humanity. For me, I hope to actually inspire you and give you the courage and the strength to dive into digital dentistry. Many of you have certain components of digital dentistry. Many of you may even fear digital dentistry, fear of the unknown, fear of how these parts and pieces integrate together, the fear of complicating our dentistry by introducing digital dentistry into our workflow is one that's a reality. But I hope to dispel that fear. And I hope to dispel that fear because integration is something that many of you are already doing. The integration between Conebeam and CAD CAM is something that has created a paradigm shift, in my opinion. By combining Conebeam and CAD CAM together seamlessly, we have an opportunity to treat implants in a different perspective. We have an opportunity to evaluate the function of our patients and certainly diagnose things that we are just now understanding fully, fully, such as sleep apnea. So 3D integration allows us to actually have a more efficient workflow. And today, I hope to define the implant workflow. And in the future, I'll certainly share with you the function and the airway, but let me show you what's actually happening. What can you actually do with CAD CAM and Conebeam? Once they are integrated, it's not just about discussing the treatment and treatment planning and showing patients what the opportunities are, but it's about the treatment that we can also render as well, in doing so in a digital fashion. So for implants, the ability to actually rapid prototype and manufacture milled surgical guides is available today. Now, when I say surgical guides, you may not be raising any eyebrows because we've known about this in particular with this group for years, that surgical guides can be made for all of our implant patients alike. What I'll share with you today is that the shift that's occurring is that these things can be made chairside within the same consultation appointment, if you will, as well. For function, we can actually, from a cone beam standpoint, have live articulation of our patient's actual functional movement patterns. And we can look at the stomatic nathic system from a bird's eye perspective. That envelope of function that you and I learned about in dental school is becoming alive. And certainly, airway, as you've all realized, an important topic in dentistry. All of these can be delivered in a digital fashion. Take this video, for example. What you see on the bottom is the integration of Conebeam and CAD-CAM 
but we've recorded our patient's actual functional movement patterns. So we're looking at the patient's envelope of function, and the data that we're collecting, we can then actually send back to our chair side milling software. So that when we actually design teeth, we're taking into account function and movement patterns, which allows us to predict the appropriate inclination of the cusps so that we can provide a restoration that has the longevity we all dream of. So these things exist, and they actually are implemented into my practice and several of you that I know in the audience. So let's define the digital workflow, at least for implantology, from my perspective. Now, there's multiple iterations of the digital workflow for implantology. Some include using labs, some include using third parties and companies who can provide each one of these pieces. But for me, being an enthusiast, having passion for dentistry, I actually enjoy all of these facets, going from clinical to the technical aspect, in milling myself, in designing myself, brings me much excitement. So this is the workflow as I see it in my practice. It always starts from a diagnostic standpoint, a cone beam, within which we can see the patient's actual anatomy in 3D, followed by a CAD-CAM impression, a digital impression that replaces analog impressioning methods. Combining those two together, as you can see in the third image, allows us in one visit to treatment plan and implant from the restorative perspective. Today, the philosophy is restoratively driven implant planning, and having these two technologies allows us to conduct a very futuristic view of how we treatment plan implants. Now, we don't just talk about where the implants could go. Using images to help us understand where Im implants can go and then using our free hands certainly is something that many of us can do. In my reality, because I'm still mastering the art of dentistry, I prefer to have guides. And so what you see on the fourth image is a milled surgical guide, milled chair side. It takes about 30 minutes at the cost of $55. The fifth image, an optical impression, digital, of the implant, and then milling the restoration all within a one hour visit. So the opportunities are here. And I need you to remember what drives you forward. For me, it's my three little ones. Someday I hope that they find a dentist and a physician to care for their needs. And I hope that that dentist, when I'm long and gone, cares about their work as much as I care about my work. That's my dream for my family. So I have to be able to encourage our field to push the envelope and stay foolish. Let me share with you a story. This is Amy. Amy's in high school. It's one week before prom. She's taking senior pictures. It's a critical moment in her life. And in the United States, this is a defining moment for a woman. Unfortunately, her orthodontist had sent me a CD of a cone beam image. And when I opened it up, I realized we had some issues. Resorption, tooth number eight, or tooth number one one. Now, at the time, we had scheduled her accordingly. Unfortunately, she showed up within a couple days without the clinical crown that had fractured on her. So this is an emergency for me. We've got prom coming up. We've got senior pictures, and most importantly, we've got her mother in the background hovering over my shoulder. So I have to share with you the digital surgical workflow. It includes a concept of scanning, planning, designing, and milling a surgical guide. So let me share with you how that's done. The first thing that we do is we take an optical impression. And within this optical impression, we have an opportunity to recreate tooth number one, one, or tooth number eight. Now, when we actually recreate this tooth, we are doing a digital wax up. 
This allows me to understand my restorative vision for this case, for Amy. So with this digital wax up, I can actually now get it to a mill stage preview. And it's within this field of view that I can export this file. There's so many different formats that are available on the market. Most commonly, it's an STL file, which is an open file. In CEREC, it's a closed system. So with CEREC, the file format is .ssi. And this file format allows us to actually integrate that with a cone beam image. Now, remind you, when we open that file from CEREC, we have to still merge it with the cone beam data. So within their software, we have an opportunity to match data together. The data on the left is an optical impression. So it's surface, surface topography of the teeth and the gingiva. The data on the right is 3D radiography, cone beam image. When we match common data landmarks, the software actually combines the data set together. So here's the original cone beam from the orthodontist. And now we can actually see the actual anatomy of the soft tissue brought forward by our CAD CAM impression. You see, we can see soft tissue and cone beam, but not at the detail that CAD CAM can provide it to us. So at this stage, we actually have an opportunity to also introduce that restoration that I feel is most appropriate to help define our vision and how we actually conduct the clinical treatment. With that, we have an opportunity to plan an implant. So once we've combined all of these components together, you can appreciate this in 3D. Now, mind you, this is the first time I've seen Amy. That's the beauty of this whole process. It's not unique in the way that these data sets actually talk to, together. There's so many third-party softwares that can do this, but the challenge that we have is that it takes multiple visits often, working in partnership with labs and third-party companies. But when you have these technologies in an office, in a clinical setting, and you can do this while the patient's in the chair, it's a game changer. And it's a game changer because now I can actually explain to the patient and the mother, my team, and for me to actually evaluate all of the details that go into planning an implant. Now, we're not just talking about where the implant should go and then relying on my free hands to provide this treatment because I'm still learning. So what I do is after the implant has been planned, I have an opportunity. I can actually send this information to a lab of my choice and have the lab partner with me, design and fabricate the surgical guide. But for me, given the dire circumstances that Amy is in, I'm gonna use the last option, which allows me to export the data. Now, once the data is exported, I can export it and print the guide if my software allows me to do so. And that would happen with an open system. With a closed system, I'm going to be milling this surgical guide. So when I export that implant plan from my cone beam software, I can now import that into my chair side CEREC machine and design a surgical guide while Amy's still in the chair. So what you see here is the actual optical impression which replaces the analog model. We're defining the seating area of the surgical guide within the software. And the software itself helps us to realize the engineering that goes into making a surgical guide. So it's a very intuitive workflow where we can design the size of the sleeve and the support structures, including inspection windows to properly confirm that the guide is seated during the procedure. So it takes about five minutes to generate a proposal like this, and we simply then position this prosthesis inside of our block, and these are two variations, cost of $55 for these PMMA blocks, and we can actually mill the surgical guide, as you see here. It takes about 30 minutes. So in an instance when a patient needs an implant and your preference is to have a guide, this becomes a realistic option. And with this surgical guide, as you see here, we have a master hole. 
Now, to ensure that the osteotomies are completely guided and controlled, we need an interface. And various companies have different ways of doing this. Some systems are keyless, which is the trend that implant companies should be going to. Other systems require keys, as you see here. With this key, we can start with our sequential osteotomy in a guided fashion, controlling both angulation and depth. Once the osteotomy is provided, we can place our implant, as you see here. Some systems allow for placement through the guide, others are freehand. But the most important part, which is the osteotomy, is controlled for me. And remember, this osteotomy was designed off of my vision from the very beginning, having a clear understanding of what the final restoration should look like, and then working backwards to ensure that all of the osteotomies and the surgical procedures are following suit. Then comes the digital restorative workflow. Now the digital restorative workflow similarly includes a process of scanning, planning, designing, and milling. And to enhance your understanding from yesterday's lecture during lunch, we'll continue from where we left off. So here's a scan post seated at site number 11, at tooth number eight. And then we simply take an optical impression once the optical impression is obtained, we can start to design our restoration. Now you've heard from some brilliant clinicians and how you can actually design the proper emergence flo uh, profile for your restorations. And I have my own variation of it myself. My variation is to have a strong sigmoid shape emergence profile. I find that this transition, a transition from having a concavity to a gentle and gradual convexity really helps to support my tissues. It allows me to see the tooth as a realistic looking tooth as it emerges from the soft tissues. Interproximally, I most often have a convexity from a profile standpoint. But the beauty of this whole workflow is all of the parts and pieces are designed to fit together. I really want you to pay attention to this. We're not just scanning a stock abutment and milling to the stock abutment. What you see here is a block that already has a precision milled hole in it. And that precision milled hole is designed specifically for the tie base. So there's no slop in the fit of this restoration. What the CEREC allows me to do is control the external surface form of the restoration. And as you see here, and for those who have CEREC, you can understand that you have full control over line angles, proximal contours and contacts, and the emergence profile within the software. Now, in order to understand the biology of how I design, I want to share a couple articles with you. I learned this technique from Dr. Park in Korea. And what Dr. Park told me was that we want to make sure that our implant restoration starts with this point. And we need to keep this point in mind throughout our entire clinical process. This point is the point of prosthetic emergence in Amy's natural tooth, and similarly, it should be the same point of aesthetic emergence for our implant restoration. So I keep that point in mind from start to finish. And in order to understand where the implant should be placed in a three-dimensional analysis, I use two articles. One is by Wenstrom, the other by Nazawa. Now, Wenstrom defines the periodontium as it exists around natural dentition. And the law of averages, according to Wenstrom, there's a vertical component and a horizontal component. Vertical being 1.5 to a ratio of one for every horizontal component. Similarly, Nazawa has a predictable ratio for implants. Now he says, the super implant mucosa has a predictable ratio of one to 1.15. So, the ratios can be combined, and it helps me as a clinician to understand the depth of placement in the three-dimensional space. And so if that's the point of aesthetic emergence, I can connect the fixture of the implant to the aesthetic emergence using this S-line. This is known also as the sigmoid notch. 
But when I develop this nice gradual S line, again, a concavity followed by a convexity, I find in my hands that the soft tissue aesthetics are brilliant. Now this doesn't apply for every case. It depends on whether the patient's dolicocephalic or brachycephalic. But then I also combine this with other digital technologies to help me understand my loading protocols. So this is something that I obtained from Dr. Park as well. And when we actually evaluate our implant stability, there's certainly a surgical approach. What's the insertion torque of our implant? That's very subjective in my opinion. In dentistry, we should be more objective. We should have data to support our clinical decisions. And today, we do have opportunities to do that in terms of understanding implant stability. And that objective data is provided by an ISQ measurement. Now, when you apply all of this knowledge together, you can predictably understand when to load your restorations. In this case, because of the high ISQ value I was able to obtain simply because of my guided osteotomies, I knew that I can actually restore this with a provisional and then come back six weeks later with a final definitive restoration. Now, this is the block that I was speaking of, lithium desilicate from Ivoclar. It's not the traditional block that we're accustomed to because this block has a pre-machined hole that interfaces with the tie base, as you see here. And then once the components are milled, we can simply combine them. Now the concept on the left, as I discussed yesterday, allows us the opportunity to create an interface, which is a mesostructure custom abutment, if you will, and then the supporting crown. But the opportunity, if planned correctly, if we go back to our original planning in Conebeam, we have an opportunity to create screw-retained prosthetics each and every time. Granted, some patients are gonna need augmentation to support the implant, but that's diagnostic in itself to help us understand what needs to happen for our patients. But if planned properly, we have an opportunity to have screw retain restorations for every situation. And I feel that that's most appropriate, granted what we know about cement sepsis and the risks of cement sepsis. And in this case, this is visit number two. In visit number two, we removed her provisional, seated the milled lithium desilicate restoration, checked our contours, refined the shape intraorally. Here's our x-ray with the tie base. Here's our provisional being removed, a milled provisional, mind you. And then all we had to do was swap out the milled provisional for the final restoration. And that's the result in two visits. Now it's pushing the envelope I don't know if this is recommended to every clinician. I'll let you know in a few years how it looks. I'll follow up and update you in five years and then 10 years, hopefully. But that's my version of guided surgery, digital dentistry. And then we can celebrate. We can celebrate our accomplishments. But the reality is, is that this had a huge impact on Amy's life. She will forever remember what it took in a dire circumstance where she loses one tooth only, but right before a very important moment in her life. So we celebrated by creating a video, and I'll share that with you. two patients there. The other patient was a congenitally missing laterals case, both celebrating prom together, both classmates. So with that, I really appreciate your attention, and that's dedicated to everyone that I've shared a smile with, both metaphorically and literally. Thank you very much.